Uh, today we are going to continue with the, uh, with the last uh, part uh, as we have started uh, from last time uh, we covered the fault mode effect analysis we didn't cover the fault mode effect analysis so we said that we are going to cover that part however uh, in specific and in relation to uh, chemical industries and this is where we are going to talk about the hazards identification. Um, I think so. The video is self-explanatory and uh, I'm going to leave you with the video. It's about 47 minutes, so it's, it's the whole lecture. So I'll keep you with the video and, uh, and if there's any problem with the video, just inform me and it should be okay. Okay, so good luck. important to know because you're going to go through a lot of what I'm going to mention today when you go to some sub kind of safety courses uh, where they mention hazard studies okay if you hear about hazard studies this is in this chapter so what do we have here okay so the, the main thing about hazards is we know what's hazards right something dangerous whatever it could be dangerous to human uh, it could be an equipment it could be something that is a release. So uh, what happens is there's a uh, hazard identification, right? Based on this hazard, uh, uh, in my hazard study, I put a scenario, a scenario of that, how this hazard will happen or scenario because of that hazard, what will happen? Okay, so there's a scenario and this scenario, I consider what probability of this of this hazard if it happens and what consequence maybe it has a high probability that this hazard substance will get released there is a high probability that there will be a release of h2s of a certain uh, limit uh, uh, limit uh, values uh, however uh, and then you say that uh, it ha the high probability that if this accident what consequence it will have right and how frequent this will happen, okay? And so it could be very dangerous, but uh, well, I'll, I'll say it the other way around. So, so it, it could be that the consequence that it is very dangerous, but it happens only once per 10 years, okay? So, so, so a considering that's very dangerous, that is an issue, but it makes it of a lower risk if it has, happens once every 10 years. But if it happens every month, but it is of a, of a very low risk, again, that brings it down. But if it has a high uh, consequence and dangerous, and it may happen every month, that is a very high risk. And consider a high risk determination, if it is yes, yeah, and we need to put a system for that. And if it's no, of course, we need a, a response for that uh, to work on an emergency response on mitigation. Mitigation, that means uh, to take an action against of this risk that we have. Uh, so we need to, to consider it, but of course, not a total operation system to be inherited within our process. Okay, so what do we have? A hazard identification described in chapter number 11 or chapter 10 in the second edition, the old edition. So we have these four things, right? For process hazard, hazard checklist, it's a simple thing. It's just a checklist. Hazard surveys, 
is, is doing a survey and know what if it is hazardous, ha, it has a high hazard or a low hazard. And the DOE index is one of the DOE indexes that you're going to use in this chapter. And number three is the hazard study, which is the hazards and operability study. And we are going to see that later. And then number four is the safety review. Okay, safety review is just an effective but less formal type of hazard study. It's like informal people sitting together and discussing with each other. Okay, now we have a hazard substance. What should we do? What are the possible consequences? So people talking with each other. Okay, so it's, it's something that is simpler in this case. So we start with number one, Prozard has a checklist. And a check checklist is something like, for example, when you go to a car uh, and you go to do some kind of uh, service for your car, your automobile, and then he checks within his list, he has a list. And, and well, instead of mentioning the list like that, so this is my list, okay? And then this list, what does he do? He says, yes, check oil engine, yes, it is checked, air pressure is good, fluid and radiator, oh my God, this is low. Uh, air filter is bad and and they always put x here even if you have good air filters <laughs> they change it okay well, i'm sorry but that's my experience my air filter always goes bad i don't know why so fluid yes you need to change your fluid level or put a fluid level and and of course everything has a price right yeah, here is like 1 bd here's like 25 bd you see i know the numbers fluid level is just like nothing and and headlights uh, yes, the, the the front light front lights are, are good. The back lights are not good. Okay, uh, exhaust system for leaks. Uh, there are always leaks. We you need to fix a leak. Fix 5 BD uh, or 50 BD. Uh, check fluid levels and brake system. You have a problem here. You need to change it. Gasoline level in tank. You have a problem. Uh, to be honest and show that you're a good person right and you need to put some of them yes and some of them no sorry i don't mean to teach you something like that it's not good so what i'm trying to say is this is just a checklist okay now imagine like making a checklist just for a car we are going to have a checklist for what for our industry oh my god you see that and and, and of course i'm not going to go through all that but just to get an idea, so this is just a general layout. For example, a checklist for my layout. Uh, areas are properly drained, firewalls. Uh, is there any obstruction to any underground hazardous, uh, hazardous over obstruction, enough headroom, uh, access for emergency vehicle? Well, let's go see something else. The buildings, are there ladders, stairways, and escape? ways are there fire doors uh, are there uh, is there any obstruction marked if there's something that will hit your head is there are there ventilations safety glasses go to the process well consequence of exposure to operations a special fume may uh, happen or dust hoods required uh, uh, Process laboratory checked for runaway explosive conditions. So you, you're checking the process here. Okay, more. We, we want more the piping. Safety showers and I require sprinkler system. So you can see how we have something that is good for our lab here. But let's see something else. <laughs> we have much more. I ju I'm just showing you the examples, just a checklist, right? And it could be different from one place to another, like venting, relief valves, or rupture disc required, check. Uh, mat ma materials of construction, corrosion resistance, checked. Vents properly designed, uh, yes, good. The flame, uh, the flame, there are uh, arresters. There is something that catches the flame on the vent line, yes. Uh, relief valves protected from plugging by rupture disc, no. We have a problem here, like, uh, for example, uh, and so on. What about the uh, instrument and electrical all control fail safe yes all of them are safe all equipment properly labeled no some of them are not labeled you see for example process safety affected by response lag yes it is affected labels for all startup switches no they don't have labels uh, so 
it's something like that and you have them for the safety equipment like for fire extinguishers and detection apparatus for raw materials if they if they you have handling equipment uh, for that and it's, and and uh, it could handle the extreme weather current conditions you have storage and so that was checklist okay that was the first part the simple straightforward and you just need to know that there's something called checklist which is important for us in our hazards identification number two is the hazard survey so survey is a survey it's to be on okay so that is a survey uh, so it's, it's like you're filling in you're asking and you're seeing what will happen and you go on and around and and see what's going to happen so here as far as has a survey as simple as an inventory of hazard materials in a facility it could be simple okay but talking about like more systematic it could be more complicated and and one of those is the dough fire and explosion index okay so we will go through that index and see how it looks like has a survey of course includes rating what does we what do we mean by rating that means you put numbers one two three four five so for example one that it is safe five it is dangerous so something like that so you put numbers so and and those numbers would be like well known and for everyone so here you rate the hazards of storing handling flammable explosive materials uh, so you rate them so that you know that in what range it is it is in a good range or a bad range and so on so this systematic approach goes uh, through uh, various steps those various steps as we can see number one a systematic approach in terms of judgmental factors okay so we don't want like any like it is you have judgmental factors of course you will always have uh, but we are trying to make it very systematic to get out of this being different from one person to another we not need something to be consistent and systematic number one break the process down into units so put sections like the reactor by itself the storage tank by itself the pump i'm going to do a hazard study on the reactor i'm going to do a hazard study on another reactor i'm going to do a hazard study on a storage tank and so on use experience to select the units or section that have the highest likelihood of a significant hazard so if you want to do a hazard study and you also may use a checklist approach in this as well go to the places where you think that you have a problem i mean don't go to the places where you feel that everything is good and okay it, it reminds me that for example i come to the class and a, a professor coming to the class or a teacher going to the class and he's saying that those who are absent i'm going to i'm going to uh, fire them i'm going to uh, make them suffer i'm going to do and actually none of them because they're always absent they're not sitting in front of them so if you want to say a word say it in the right place right so here i'm saying that of course you will use the previous experience that you already written and and where you, you know there are failures or possible hazards that could come out uh, and and there you run your hazard study number three determine the material factors which means what chemicals are being used if you know what chemicals are being used maybe those chemicals are flammable maybe those chemicals are explosive so this will help you in what in your hazard study and then you're going to adjust this with penalties what do i mean by penalty it's flammable you put a penalty that means you're going to count that number that you're indicating or you're rating uh, that this this could cause some hazards uh, so i need to consider this and actually you will put another penalty if they don't have safety procedures right <laughs> so you put another penalty if they don't have safety procedures now if it is flammable and it is very it has as an exothermic reaction and it's very volatile you're having a penalty or a penalty or a penalty and if you don't have safety procedures of that you have another penalty it's like you're saying like you imagine adding all those penalties you're going to have a high number saying that my hand of steady state that we have we have a problem in this place finally we are going to have the rates and you're going to compare with the table of course and with the experience uh, what do we have here uh, here is the dough fire and explosion index the one i just mentioned 
And let's have a look. Let's have a look. How do they look like? For example, let's go at the top. Foreign Explosion Index. The country Bahrain division. I don't know where location in Sukhair uh, process unit. The water desalination unit in uh, Sukhair. Uh, the building. Uh, this is me. And then you're going to start, for example, uh, with the material factor. Okay. Uh, so what we have here, you're going to see the first thing is the process hazards exothermic chemical reactions so the the penalty is from 0.3 to 1.25 so what penalty you're going to add here for example the very high exothermic reaction you're going to put 1.25 okay uh, and then endothermic processes less of course you can see 0.2 to 0.4 and um, material handling and transfer you're going to have less uh, if you don't have good material handling you're going to put one and you, you see that you can add penalties here uh, depending on what you have so this is the range and these are the factors used here a special uh, process hazard so if it is toxic you're going to add some penalty then and of course depending on which pressure range what flammable region what is the pressure operating pressure and if you have relief setting for that uh, and of course if you have Low, uh, for example, co uh, corrosion or erosion, some leakages, do you have fire equipment or not, and so on. And then you're going to add some special factors uh, in which you feel that you must add if it is very dangerous, uh, uh, and, and then you're going to multiply whatever you found for F1 into F2 to get an F3, and then if you have an explosive material, the material factor you're using, you're also going to put that here. For no penalty, you're going to add zero. Uh, so what you're trying to say here, this is what you're going to do. You're, you're, you're having an index, and this is the survey. We said we are talking about hazard surveys, but in this hazard surveys, one of them is like more complicated like rather than a simple survey you do it by your own, in which it is an index putting penalties and saying that this place is hazard or not. So. Uh, of course, you can use also the, the what they call the loss control credit factors, okay? Uh, which means what? It means that uh, what about if you want to add a credit? You see, you want to add a credit. That means I have an emergency power, okay? I have a cooling system. I have a control in my explosion. I have a shutdown emergency system. I have a computer control of everything. I have inert gas for inerting and so on. So what you're saying that you're adding credits, adding credits. And this added credit value, it will also uh, identify. Let me continue. My, my material association credit factor that I have all my control valves is remote and everything uh, is, is, is under control. I don't dump things. I have a blow down. I have also a drainage system, an interlock system also. Uh, for fire protection, I have leak detection, I have fire water supply, so I have everything. I have extinguishers, and I have a protection for all my cables, I have foam to put off my fires, I have also curtains, I mean water, uh, like water curtains to put off fire, and then I have value for C1, C2, 3, and I multiply them, and this will give me the loss control credit factor. And I also can have a summary analysis, uh, sorry, the risk analysis summary, in which I put my fire, uh, index and and uh, and of course I can put the details. There are a lot of details here: radius of exposure, area of exposure, just to reflect and decide based on the index, based on the areas that are exposed, the damage factor and that co control credit factor that I have. And and putting all those information, I can also put a value and see how much uh, does that uh, contribute in total. So uh, now, just to get an idea, if you have uh, a fire and explosion index, the door fire and explosion index of 1 to 60, you can say that the degree of hazard is light. If you have it from 61 to 96, it's moderate. And then it's intermediate, heavy, and it could be severe if it is greater than 159. And uh, this uh, index is used to determine the consequences of an accident. This includes the maximum probable property damage and the maximum probable uh, days outage. So what damage and how many days you're going to uh, lose of, of that. 
So that is the has of study, okay? That is the has of study. Uh, can we get a little also an idea of this has of study? We have seen the do index, but it's good to see like uh, how, how do we think when we go through that? Uh, because I told you one way of, of uh, an index, but there are other surveys that you can use. So what is the basic of all that? The basic of all of that are these steps here. So you begin with a detailed flow sheet in front of you, having all the process units, and I'm going to, you're going to select a study node. I'm going to study that place. I'm going to study these process variables. I'm going to study these process lines. I'm going to study that prop pump or that compressor or that heat exchanger. And then I'm going to study the flow or the level uh, of, of the, uh, of the, uh, in the process vessel. I'm going to study the temperature in that heat exchanger. I'm going to study the pressure in that vessel, okay? And, and then you're going to use some words that would help you in your hands of study, okay? Uh, so, uh, why you're using these words? Uh, to the process parameters, which are these, to suggest few possible deviation, which means I will have low temperature, my temperature will go down, or I will have high pressure, okay? And, and, and the viscosity is going to be very high. The flow rate is going to be very low. The level is going to be very high, it will overflow, okay? Well, I, when I said overflow, is the consequence, but the deviation that it went high, okay? Higher than a certain set point or a limit that I'm identifying here. So I have guide words like low, high, uh, to these parameters to suggest possible deviation. So I have a deviation. When you have a deviation, there are consequences, okay? Blow, blowing off or overflow or whatever could happen there, right? There is a consequence. And, and, and then you're going to recommend action. And you're going to recommend action like we need to change the design, not the usual case. We need to change the equipment, not the usual case. We need to change the operating procedures, that is usual. We need to improve our payment maintenance, that is uh, 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 usual as well. And we need to investigate more and see what we need to do. But remember, when you recommend action, you need to identify what you're going to do exactly and who is going to do it and when he's going to do it. When you put this, this is like an action plan, action plan to have things done correctly. If you don't know what to do, how do you expect that it will be done if you don't know what to do? If no one is going to, as no one is assigned to do it, then even if you say, we will do this, but who will do it? <laughs> you did not say a name, you did not pronounce it. Okay, so if you say what you want to do and you say who will do it, but you didn't give him a time limit, that means he may take a year to do it. And actually you want to finish it in a month, for example. Okay, so you need to recommend the actions really correctly. And then of course you record all the information, all what you have done, all the data used, all of working papers and all your hazard worksheets. Can we see other hazard worksheets like other than the DOE index there? Yes, yes, of course. But before we go and see the, and the, 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 DO, uh, the other hazard surveys, Let's see the, the words, the guide words that I was talking about low and high to the process parameters. And these are simple ones, and then I'm going to show you a big list. But just to see the simple words, for example, the no more less, okay? No, that means it's not present. More, that means it's increasing, a higher pressure, right? It's more pressure, higher pressure. Less, that means it's a lower pressure. And then you're going to say, <clears throat> you're going to identify based on that what are the consequences if i have a high pressure uh, for example a greater activity that intended flow rate pressure rise uh, it, there is going to be a consequence of that right there is no consequence really here mentioned very clearly so what do we have you have a guide words for the hazard procedure you see it? all of these and there are many words actually uh, you can go to more and more words but uh, these are the very uh, nice words. It's easy, it's easy to write them rather than writing things that are uh, very long. The pressure is very high. And uh, so you just write what? You already know that you're studying the pressure. You've written that, that you're going to write high, okay? Or more, I mean, more or higher. Just giving you an indication that and there's a quantitative increase in that temperature or pressure or whatever. 
okay so it does not happen none more higher greater it increases less lower it decreases as well as happening within some kind of, of, of uh, same time uh, part of reverse the opposite thing uh, everyone give every one of these words gives you a little different meaning so let's see here for example there is a guide telling you that what usually is used okay from their experience so the valid guide words and process parameters combination for process lines are as follows so flow we can say the flow stopped the pump is not working the flow increased for some reason I don't know why it went down as well as happening with something else part of it happening it's reverse I don't know how <laughs> okay the temperature stopped you cannot say the temperature stopped you cannot say the pressure stopped okay it's either go up or down okay so that you can see that things that make sense concentration uh, there's no input of concentration that does there's, there's nothing getting in you cannot say there's no pre-edge right and so and these are the things that are usually that you can find and you also can find sorry the val the valid guide word as well uh, for 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 uh, for process combinations uh, such as uh, you have here level temperature pressure and, and and so these are two beautiful uh, two beautiful uh, uh, tables uh, sorry for that so these are two beautiful tables that we have. Uh, this is for the process lines and this is for the process vessels. Okay, uh, you're to, it's good to have guidelines for for us. And 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 here's something that you can also add. This is a worksheet, and you can develop many different worksheets. Just mentioning the guide words that you have, and what are the consequences if you have more pressure, and 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 what are the safeguards that you're going to protect and what recommendations you're going to add. You see, this is a bigger one. I know that will confuse your eye, but you're talking about a certain unit or a certain node in, in, your, in, your, in your, it's shown in the plug flow diagram. You have its number here. And then you're mentioning about a flow that it is increasing or, or a level which is higher and so on. Uh, let's take a, a, an example just to get the idea. So what do we have here? We have an, a reactor and we are trying to form wh what we have is here is that we have an ammonia and phosphoric acid react to form diammonium phosphate DAP a non-hazardous product the DAP flows from the reactor to an open storage tank so this is the storage tank the relief valves are provided on the storage tank the reactor will discharge to outside on the closed area so you have relief valves if too much phosphoric acid let, let me enlarge this I feel that you feel that if too much phosphoric acid is fed to the reactor compared to the ammonia feed rate and off specification products are created. So of course, when you have more phosphoric acid, you don't have the specification of the product that you're trying to achieve, but the reaction is safe. If the ammonia phosphoric acid flow rates both increase, the rate of energy will accelerate, oh my God, and the reactor as design may be enabled to handle the resulting increase in temperature and pressure. So if you have more ammonia, you may have a problem. If too much ammonia is fed to the reactor as compared to the normal phosphoric acid feed rate, unreacted ammonia may carry over the damp storage tank. Okay, so this one, you have more and more and then it overflows. Any residual ammonia in the damp tank will be re re released into the enclosed work area causing personal exposure. So if you have going out here, uh, 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 this will cause some exposure to some people working around this reactor and it could be a problem. Okay, great. So what do we have here? So just giving you an example, an example here, just look at it. Uh, so we have has of team number three, maybe you, drawing number, uh, this, is, this was the date and that was 27-6-1981. Revision number three, and when we went there, what did we see? We put our item number, okay, just to refer back to it. We are, we are talking about the line of the phosphoric acid feed line to the deep re deep DAP reactor. Deliver acid feed to the reactor at the rate of that GPM and YPSIG. Okay, figure 6.6. .6. So what happens, the flow, either we have less flow or no flow uh, of phosphoric acid. So there's no feed material in the phosphoric acid tank. 
and and this means the causes also uh, another cause of that why this is happening why you have no phosphoric acid no feed material uh, that means we don't have any input my my storage that i'm trying to, uh, that i'm using to to have phosphoric acid is empty my flow indicator is not working it's, it's high operator sets phosphoric acid too low by mistake consequences unreacted ammonia i have a lot of ammonia which is unreacted uh, in the reactor carried to the the, the dap uh, the, the storage tank and released to the the work area you have a lot of ammonia released oh my god uh, so what i need to do i need to have safeguard periodic maintenance of valve v to make sure that this doesn't happen and i need to have ammonia detector as well and an alarm actions consider adding an alarm shutdown of the system for low phosphoric acid so we will consider this action so this will never happen and ensure periodic maintenance of the valve v is advocate so we have now safeguards, but uh, other than the safeguards that we have already in place, we may think of additional actions so that this does not happen. Okay, so we have safeguards, but we may have more actions. You see how beautiful is that? And I know that if you think of the dough index, you, see, you feel, oh my God, that was complicated. There are different ways of looking at things, but this is the standard way that I'm trying to explain here. And, and uh, for example, uh, the, the vessel uh, DAP reactor contained the reaction and we want to contain the reaction at a certain degree centigrade and PSI uh, pressure. Loss of agitation, there's no agitation. Agitator motor fails or the, the, the mechanical linkage fails. So what do I have? I have unreacted, nothing is reacting or there's little reacted uh, reaction and there's unreacted ammonia reactor carried again to the tank and released to the work area and again the same thing here and we are considering a shutdown if the agitation stops okay and there's something more of course here i'm just showing you a cut of that thing and uh, this is an example that we have taken before for example we have an exothermic reaction of having monomers in to produce a monomer and what do i have i have a cooling water in cooling down the system why because it's an exothermic reaction i just want to cool down the system okay cool down the system i have a temperature controller here just to make sure that if the temperature goes very high i pump on in more water i open the valve to have more water entering to cool out the system so that is my uh, my example here so i will have also a hazard analysis study a little different from what i i had seen just now but it still gives you uh, it still gives you an idea of what you are trying to achieve here. So again, the project name, a certain date, the reactor, uh, it's written the name of the reactor, for example, 10-2. Of course, this is the, just an example. So I'm saying that I, I, I'm putting in just a reference item here. I'm going to study the cooling coil, the flow of the cooling coil. If it stopped, if the cooling if the flow rate of the cooling stop, there's no cooling water in. So what are the possible causes? The control valve fails closed. So you have the control valve is not working or there's plugging in the coil or the cooling water service is failing for some reason. Uh, the controller fails and closes the valve. It fails and closes the valve. I don't know how this happens because it should, if it fails, we should make it fail open rather than then fail closed because it's a cooling, it's not heating. So if it fails, it should cool, not heat. Okay, so that, that's a problem where it closes the valve. Air pressure fails. You, you can see there are many things here. And then there's a deviation guide words, which means if there's no flow, this these are the possible reasons for that. Maybe I have the deviation, it's a high flow. High flow, which means that the air pressure fails and now I have a high flow. Or the control valve is failing and, and it's opening. Because the front now, the control valve fails, it opens, which makes sense. That's why I have a high flow. Or it could be that I have a low flow. You see, I'm having different possible causes depending, depending on the deviation guide words for the process parameter that of the study node that I'm studying in the reactor, the vessel, right? And then you're going to put the consequences. If the control valve uh, closed and there's no inside, there's no cooling. So I have no cooling, possible runaway reaction where you have high 
is going up. So what are you going to do? You're going to select the valve to, to fail open. And that's what I said, like you need to select the valve to have it fail open, not closing. Uh, and you're going to put a field uh, maintenance procedure and, and so on. Okay, who's going to do it? These people are going to do it. When they are going to do it, they're going to do it in this date, okay? And, and, and you can see here, this one is like more uh, sophisticated and has more details. And if you want to go now more into that, this is the big one. I just, just that one, this previous one was just a shot, uh, a cut from that part here. And they have more, of course, if you want to go through. Okay, great. Uh, so we have one now, we, we went through the hazard, uh, we went through the number one, uh, where we were talking uh, uh, about the checklist. And then we went to the hazard surveys where we were talking about the DOE index. And then we went to the HAZOP study. And this is the, uh, we just finished the HAZOP study. And the last thing we have in this chapter is the safety review, safety reviews. And safety reviews just bringing people, group of people, and they talk together. And they, of course, they experienced people. The review team, uh, what do they do? They identify what are the hazards and then they try to eliminate those hazards through the looking at the design procedures. And the review involves, involves, involves or includes finding the initiating event. So why, why does this hazard go out uh, uh, really to, and harming people? What is initiating it? What is going wrong? And what is upsetting our process? And then of course the team comes up with the recommendations with are the actions. And, and this could be equipment or actions in control or procedures. And, and then the focus should be on developing high quality review, okay? That prevents, they want to prevent injuries, they want to prevent damages and so on. So this is like a safety review. And this is a checklist of some uh, uh, informal, and because sometimes you have it formal or informal, sometimes informal is good because it's less pressure and you talk very freely between people rather than making it formal. And, and here where you can see that the, the design features to prevent accidents and they, they sit together, they identify the materials they have. Well, uh, what are the materials that are flammable in our system? These are the materials. And so we need, we need this information, the auto ignition temperature, the lower flammable limit, the upper flammable limit, and the flash point of all flammable materials, okay? And, and so on. Uh, explosivity, toxicity, corrosivity, and equipment so they they get all this information imagine they have all this information about the equipment procedures the materials the startups the shutdowns the cleaning process they have all that information so it's like a checklist for them so that they are ready to 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 work on it now just just to get an idea about about the safety review uh, let's look and uh, have a look on the uh, example one three so this is example 11.3, where we can see the example, consider the laboratory reactor system. So this is the laboratory reactor system shown in 11.9. This system is designed to react false gene with any line to produce ISO, cyanide, and HCl. These, these, these components, they are very dangerous, by the way. Uh, the reaction is shown in the figure, the ISO, cyanide, is used for the production of foams and plastics. Okay, so this is what we have. We have aniline with false gene producing isocyanate. And, and that's the reactor that we have here. What do we have? We have just pumping in the reactant, which is false gene. And, and of course, it, it, it reacts with aniline. And, and, and after, you, you will have, of course, your isocyanate. Uh, and what do we have? We have a condenser where we want to collect things. And, and of course the scrubber, uh, because you're going to have a lot of uh, emissions and you should be careful of those emissions as, as well, especially if you have uh, uh, the hydrochloride and you have also chlorine could be part when this separates due to high temperature. Okay, and, and there is some information about that false gene is colorless. It has a boiling point, a very low boiling point. You can see here 
the threshold limit value for false genes 0.1 ppm so we should consider that no one is going to be exposed to that and how long he can be exposed to it aniline is also uh, dangerous and it has a 2 ppm so on so once the safety review was completed the safety was completed by two individuals the final process design you see only two people huh so they sat together the final process shown in 11 11 the changes and additions to the process are as follows so they decided to change something in the process vacuum is added to reduce boiling temperature so they want to add vacuum so that's number one uh, and the and why do they want to do this so they just make sure that they keep everything as liquid the relief system is added uh, an outlet to a scrubber so they are adding uh, a relief system to the scrubber and the reason that they are adding to the uh, scrubber uh, to prevent any hazards resulting from a plugged fritted glass bubbler okay uh, wow we could have also uh, uh, it's, it's all because of the gas bubbler and, and then it gets plugged, we could have a problem there. Flow indicator provides visual indication of flow. That means something you can see how the flow is flowing. Bubblers are used instead of uh, scrubbers. Ammonium hydroxide bubbler is more effective for absorbing phosgene. Trap catches liquid phosgene and so on. So what, 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 what the thing that they came up with, of course, this is very uh, specific and detailed and it needs a lot of expertise about even the components and, and the details of this process. So these two, they have a very uh, thorough understanding and experience of this plant. And, and that was their informal safety review where they sat with each other and they recommended the following one, two, three. The uh, phosgene indicator and having a checklist and putting an update sketch for this process and so on you can see that of course you can have a formal view where you have everything all the information about everything the summary the reaction the engineering data the materials the equipment the procedures and, and you can have everything so that you can go to the next step and 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 do your uh, safety uh, procedure there or the safety review okay uh, this is another system of 11.4 again uh, some kind of a system here uh, you, you can go through this but there's there's something added here where you need to add relief valves and some grounding because of static charges and and this is some kind of a shape where they decided to do this uh, and and and, and uh, they had Added, added a lot of stuff just and that was like a formal safety where they had all the information about everything within the, this plant and and just to say something here that sometimes it is better to discuss and sit together rather than having a hazard study and a survey because people when they sit together it becomes a lot of qualitative ideas that that are coming out of that discussion between experienced people and, and, and the hazard study could not do or give you an indication about what is the solution in that sense, rather than people discussing with each other. And by the way, both methods are good because one is quantitative, telling you how severe it is, and another, which is qualitative, where they come up with solutions, okay? Great, so that was, that was it for this part. And what else do we have? The final part is the other methods. There are many other methods like what if analysis, human error analysis, failure mode uh, effect analysis. Uh, there are many, many. And, and just to mention one of them, I, so I just went and find out uh, one of them here, which is the what if analysis. It's an unstructured analysis and using a questions like what if or rather than how. So it's not how did the problem happen? No. It's, it's like someone who's searching for what? Searching for problems, okay? So searching for problems. So so he goes and say, what if the pressure goes up? Okay, and you're telling him it will never go up. Okay, what if it goes up? What if the pump, uh, the, the pump is pumping more uh, reactants inside? What if the cooling stops and the heat is just developing within the reactor and we are having more gases. What if the level controller is not working well and the level went up and the 
gases are just squeezed and putting more pressure. What if, what if, what if, okay? So this is like an unstructured way and saying what if. Okay, so an annoying person who's always saying what if, if this happens, okay? Listing all the problems and of course then suggesting methods to overcome which are called mitigation methods. And, and for example, and so giving an example here, what if the water flow stops? What if then let, let, uh, the liquefied natural gas, which is very cold, is stopped? What if the natural gas temperature is too low? What if the water is too low? What if the water pressure is too high? And then you come up with all of your questions of what if, what is the consequence? So if here is fine if it is no consequence, but there's a consequence here where the water could freeze and that could, could cause a rupture to your shell and your heat exchanger with hundreds of thousands, you just throw it away. I mean, and that, and that, that is another that you're going to lose product and so on. And what is the recommendation is to put an interlock to stop any uh, liquefied natural gas flow if water flow is stopped. Okay. And what if this, let's see what is the hazard here. Is there a hazard? Uh, sometimes there's hazard, sometimes there's no hazard, like no hazard, hazardness. You don't need to take any action. But if there's something like downstream piping may become imbrittle, so you need to monitor the gas low temperature. Or for example, the water flow is too low, the natural gas temperature may be too low as well. Water may freeze inside tubes, so you need an alarm for the flow to monitor flow rate. And maybe you add a controller system also for the flow. So this is the what if analysis. Begin with the drawings, you put a what if, and then you put all the consequences and you recommend the actions. You recommend the actions. And of course you record all the information that you need. This is like a real one that you, you, you can see for what NF analysis sheet rather than an example, where it says in the reactor, if you have toxic releases, like what if the phosphoric acid concentration is too low? And we have already taken an example, but now this is in the sense of what if. Uh, so what happens if it's too low? We said if you have less phosphoric acid, you have more ammonia, unreacted ammonia, going to the storage tank and goes to release. You have a safeguard detector and alarm, a detector for ammonia, of course, if there's a release. And the recommendation is to verify phosphoric concentration before filling, filling the storage tank, okay? We make sure that we have phosphoric uh, concentration. We don't discover that this concentration was too low, so it's not reacting with ammonia and so on. So that was the part of what if analysis. We, we have covered the checklist, we have covered the hazard surveys, we have covered the ha hazard studies and the safety reviews and the what if, if analysis in this video. I hope that you have gained a lot from chapter number 11 and our next chapter that we are going to cover uh, in our next video will be chapter number 12 about risk assessment till then thank you very much I, I i thank you very much for putting an effort to learn because learning is the best thing in this life and and remember that a part of learning and a part of saying that if, if you really learn is to give and because if you give of what you have learned that means you have learned correctly Thank you very much, Master. Okay. Okay, that was good. And, 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 uh, that was a good session. Uh, hello, so I open time for questions. Any questions? It could be a good idea that on Sunday we we could cover uh, some more hazard studies. Uh, this just came to my mind, and uh, I, I'm going to get a group of hazard studies that, ha that that is already available online. And when I'm going to bring something, I'm going to bring something that is similar to the reactor uh, cooling thing, uh, where you need to identify. Uh, I mean, all of your chemical genes. You know that if it's exothermic, you already need to consider. Uh, if temperature is too high or the cooling water is uh, is uh, uh, had been blocked for some reason or the control valve is not working so there's no cooling water so the temperature is going high and again everything uh, collapses there when temperature is high or pressure is high uh, so yes 
يعني I think so. These are some examples that we may also cover again on Sunday. We'll see that. So any questions? And then uh, doesn't seem that Allah uh, fiq. I hope that you learned from what we have covered today. It's more I mean from I mean this these last two weeks or little more about three weeks. Uh, it was a very uh, connected to chemical engineering practices that and that's what makes it enjoyable. Uh, definitely. Bas yaatikum al afiyah wa barak Allah fiqum and uh, see you inshallah on Sunday. With Taufik. That is the end of our lectures. I mean, a lec a end of our material, but we are going to have a lecture on Sunday uh, for more examples, maybe of hazard study. Uh, that's all. All the best. With Taufik.